Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Children and Young People Select Committee. Sorry, we're slightly late starting. Um, we've got some guests today from Powys County Council, so welcome to you. Feel free to uh, jo join in if you want to ask any questions, and we're going to sort of put aside a bit of time at the end to talk to you, the chair and myself. Um, first item on the agenda, we need to elect a chair for today. Um, this has been actually done through council, so uh, the chair will be Councillor Grockett, and then we will proceed to elect a vice chair. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, the next item on the agenda then is to appoint a vice chair. Are there any nominations for that? Councillor Laura Jones. Councillor Laura Jones, seconded by uh, Councillor Woodhouse. Are there any other nominations? The dream team carries on. <laughs> uh, thank you, colleagues, for, uh, for your support. It may not last till the end of the meeting, we shall see. Um, Item three uh, are apologies for absence. Have we got any apologies? Yes, we have apologies for absence from uh, Dr. Annette Daly and also from Keith Plough. Uh, right, before we go any further, if we could just do our usual introductions for the millions who are watching on live streaming. <laughs> Um, and, and I'd like to uh, extend an invitation to our, our, our uh, two uh, guests from, from Paris to introduce yourselves as well. You just press the little button on your mic and you get the full glare of the camera as well as the microphone. But I'd also like to welcome you this morning. And, and uh, as, as uh, my colleague here said, if, if you want to make a point, then certainly I'd be more than happy to, to bring you into our discussion. So, um, my name is Martin Grokert, I'm the member for Lansdowne Ward in Abergavenny, and uh, thank you very much, I chair this committee. Uh, Councillor Laura Jones, now Deputy Chair, thank you, um, and uh, Councillor from Wysham. Hazel Eilert, uh, Scrutiny Manager. Wendy Barnard, Democratic Services. Will McLean, Chief Officer, Children and Young People. Ruth Donovan, Assistant Head of Finance for Revenues. Hi, I'm Mike Fowler, Parent Governor Representative. County Councillor Maureen Powell, Councillor for Castle Ward and Abergavenny, and a member of the committee. I'm Jo Watkins, Councillor for Caldecott Castle Ward, and a member of the committee. Hi, I'm Hannah Jones, Youth Enterprise Manager. I'm here to present a report today. Reverend Malcolm Lane, County Council for Mardi, outside Abergavenny, and a member of this committee. Louise Brown, County Council for Shaw Newton Ward, and member of this committee. Nikki Wellington, Finance Manager for CYP. Borida, Tudor Thomas. Um, County Councillor for Priory Ward in Abergavenny and a member of this committee. Good morning all. I'm David Jones and I'm a County Councillor for Gillsfield Ward on Powys County Council. And Powys has recently had a very critical report of its children's services. And I'm here from, I was one of the scrutiny members to see how you do scrutiny. And hopefully we can improve our position <laughs> from what we learn. Thank you very much indeed. We, we will do our best to behave ourselves in that case. <laughs> uh, thank you very much and good morning all. And obviously contrary to popular belief, I am not from Paris. As a previous member uh, of its August Council, I'm delighted to be here today uh, accompanying David because I'm working, doing some work for the WLGA in respect to the children's services issues in Powys. And so this is part of a number of meetings where Powys members are coming along to see just what good scrutiny looks like. Many thanks, Chair. Councillor Val Smith, Lambadic Ward, observing. County Councillor Roger Harris, Crisson and Ward in Abergavenny and observing this committee. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, 
declarations of interest. Uh, there may be one or two today, certainly in the context of the ALN review. If, if I make any comment, as a, uh, I'm also a, a governor at King Henry, um, but, but if it's necessary, let's make those declarations uh, rather than just assuming at this point that we're going to speak. Councillor Harris, you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, declaring a, a personal interest. I'm a governor of Derryview School that is uh, uh, an active part, if you like, of the uh, ALN review. Okay. Um, agenda item five is the public open forum. I don't think there are any members of the public who wish to address committee this morning. Okay, fine. Um, so, uh, item six then is the confirmation of the minutes of our meeting on the 17th of May. Uh, firstly, are they an accurate uh, reflection of our meeting? Uh, and are there any matters arising that members would like to bring to our attention? In that case, would somebody like to propose their acceptance? Councillor Woodhouse, seconded by Councillor Thomas. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the first of our reports this morning is Agenda Item 7, and that's a report on care leavers and, and council tax exemption. <coughs> so uh, if we could move on to that item, who, you're going to lead that? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me along to your committee. Um, you have before you a report that is due to go to Cabinet now next week with regard to exempting care leavers from council tax. The report seeks to exempt all care leavers up to the age of 25 from paying council tax and the recommendation is to award 100% discretionary relief to all carers, sorry, care leavers aged between 18 and 25 residing in the County of Monmouthshire. With regard to some background to this, this was something that um, started to be debated around October 2017 when Torvine County Borough Council became the first uh, council in Wales to decide to exempt care leavers from care paying council tax. Since then, there's been various discussions at various levels um, and we were hoping that the Welsh Government would actually provide a general exemption across Wales for this the care leavers. However, this hasn't come about, um, and the Welsh Government are pinpointing the current legislation that we all work to for each authority to implement their own scheme. This is essentially the purpose of, of this report, to seek approval to extend relief to care leavers from both Monmouthshire and other local authorities. So that's taking it a little bit further than some of the other authorities have chosen to do. If I could draw your attention to bullet point 4.4.2 um, on page 12 of your pack, this outlines the proposals of the relief and how the scheme would work um, from an operational day-to-day -day basis within the revenues team. The, the key points being that the care lever needs to be aged between 18 and 25, be fully exempt from paying council tax on any other basis. Discounts would be awarded um, to the net liability after all other discounts and exemptions have been awarded. Um, the relief will apply to council taxpayers for whom their local council held corporate parenting responsibilities at the time that the claimant left care and who were residing in Monmouthshire and are liable to pay council tax to Monmouthshire County Council. We're proposing that the relief would be awarded from the 1819 financial year, so from 1st of April 2018. And once a care leaver turns 26, then full council tax would then be full due. Um, with regard to the resource implications of this, we've worked with um, our own children's services team to try and identify the number of care leavers. And currently we've identified that there are 68 at the moment of which we know that 37 of those are currently living within the County of Monmouthshire. Further analysis shows that um, four of those care leavers are currently liable to pay council tax to the value of just around um, £3,500. So it's not a, a large number of, of people involved. We also have identified that there's a further 12 care leavers that are expected to turn 18 now within this financial year, 2018-19. And if we apply the same sort of assumptions, we're looking at around about another £3,000 likely charge this year. 
So in turn, we think that would cost the authority about £6,500. At the moment, it's not possible to identify how many care leavers may be living in the authority who have come to us from other authorities. But again, on the basis of the analysis we've done so far, we don't anticipate that to be at a particularly high cost to the authority. So the cost of, of this scheme would fall to Monmouthshire County Council to pay. It wouldn't affect any of the other precepting bodies, and it would, would call, fall to the council tax budget, essentially. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Donovan. Um, I'd uh, point out to members that this item has actually come to us originally. It was going to go straight to committee. But, but I think it is an important uh, area where, as corporate parents, we can actually show that we do care for uh, young people as they leave care. And you've only got to look nationally at the difficulties that that group of, of young people and young adults have. Uh, and the struggle that many of them go through once they leave care. Uh, I, I think this is a, a positive step we can make as corporate parents helping uh, people into the world. Uh, Councillor Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to commend this uh, suggestion. Being Vice Chair of um, Cared for Children, I, I've seen it firsthand uh, over the last year. It's been a huge learning curve. Obviously, most children going into care are coming from quite challenging backgrounds and very disruptive lives. And when they leave that protection uh, at 18, when they, in effect, become adults, I think anything that we can do to mitigate the difficulties that they've faced, and in reality, it, it, it's a small gesture, but, but I think a very worthwhile one. Uh, and I, I personally, I, I think we should commend this and, and, and hopefully pass this today to show that we do care about these children and that we will help them uh, in a small financial way as, as they're starting the road into adulthood. And in terms of uh, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, we want to see care for children going into society and becoming useful and, and happy and, and worthwhile um, people. So I, I think it's very important that we, we do everything that we can to support them. So I would commend this myself. Yeah, th thanks very much for that, Councillor Thomas. Councillor Watkins. Yes, likewise, I'd like to um, agree that this is a really important step that we need to take. And also in terms of how we talk about how we wish to keep young people within the county, then this is a really obvious way that we can help. Because let's face it, Monmouthshire rents are really expensive and the living costs to stay in Monmouthshire are really difficult. And so for our care leavers, it's a really important step that we can take, which might just help keep them within their local communities still. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mr Fowler. Um, it's a great, um, admirable thing for the council to be doing, um, and especially for these very vulnerable uh, young adults. I, I think it's an excellent step. Um, it's interesting to see that Torvine uh, were the first um, council to do it, and this scheme seems to be a little bit wider in its scope, which is another good thing. Um, I just wonder what our other neighbouring counties are doing as well, and how we stack up against that it's a bit of a mix at the moment. We know of nine other local authorities who have recently introduced a scheme. Um, certainly Cardiff has introduced one quite recently. Um, Rhonda and Taft being another one. Um, Bliner and Caffili, I believe, have schemes that they're developing at the moment as our, our new port. Um, but they're all much of a muchness in terms of, of the basis that we're, we're applying. Some of them are going to the age of 21, whereas we're proposing to extend to 25. But it's, it's essentially the same, same principles. Uh, Councillor Brown. Yes, uh, certainly if you um, uh, look at any research on this, you can find that um, care leavers do, do struggle. And, you know, obviously the assistance that the council uh, can provide as corporate pa parents has to be, has to be welcomed. Um, I just wondered how it interacted with um, other benefits, for example, like uh, universal credit, um, with that coming in. Will, will that make any any difference, this uh, council tax exemption in relation to whatever calculations they do on that, or is it totally different? Perhaps you could tell me that. Thank you. Well, this, this exemption would apply after all other um, exemptions and discounts have, have been taken into account, so it's the net liability that remains. 
So um, somebody may um, be having council tax um, support at the moment. They may be on housing benefit, which eventually will become universal credit. Um, somebody, they may be a student and have a student exemption already. So we take those into account first, and then whatever's left to pay for council tax would be the amount that we are exempting under this scheme. Um, you want to come back on that, Councillor Brown, and, and then Councillor Woodhouse? Yeah, so basically, in simple terms, it will be on top of... Yes, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so just if, trying to if, understand it in very, very yes, simple terms. If, so, you know, because obviously, um, you know, you wouldn't want to sort of um, say we've got this scheme that's going to help. And then in reality, um, because of all the different welfare calculations, it doesn't help. But what you're saying to me, it does, which is good. Thank you. Okay. Right. It's good to see other authorities are moving in the same direction as us because I do support this. I think this is a good move. Um, am I right in thinking that people from other authorities that move into Monmouthshire are exempt as well? It, it applies across the board to everybody living in Monmouthshire? Yes, that's what we're proposing. Not everybody's scheme actually does that. The Torvine scheme, for example, is only targeted at those care leavers that are Momish, uh, sorry, Torvine's care leavers that live in Torvine, but we've made the decision to extend it to all care leavers. Okay, any other final comments before we move on? Well, I, I think this is a very easy one for me to sum up from the chair then. We've got a good news story here, uh, a scheme that every, every member of this committee who's spoken has been in favour of it. Uh, we commend it, we thank the officer for bringing the report, and we wish it well when it gets to Cabinet. Uh, and, and I think it's one of those stories where you can actually think, isn't it good to, uh, to live in Monmouthshire? <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. Um, if we can move on then to our next report, which is Agenda Item 8, which is um, about uh, a renewal of the NEAT reduction strategy. NEAT, of course, not in education, employment or training. Um, our previous strategy has expired and we have a statutory duty to put a new policy into place. At our pre-meeting, we, we uh, raised some interesting points here, uh, but, but all in, in support of young people who find themselves as NEAT. So, um, over to you. Uh, yeah, come, come, come up and, and have the full glare of the floodlights on you. <laughs> okay, thank you, um, Chair and Committee. So I'm here this morning to present our great start for all, our draft uh, new NEAT strategy. Um, NEAT, as the Chair said, um, said, for not in education, training or employment. Um, the purpose to present the report is, is for uh, the committee to um, have a look at the strategy. Um, are there any, any feedback, uh, you know, scrutiny in terms of do you feel it is, is what it says on the tin? Um, the committee, after endorsement, the strategy will go to Cabinet then next week. Um, for us, the key issues is for us to ensure we, we um, uh, demonstrate our commitment as, as a local authority to our children and young people to ensure there's better opportunities and better outcomes for their futures. Um, the strategy has been written around the youth engagement and progression framework. Um, this framework has been in place for some time now with Welsh Government and the action plan is around the six key priorities of the framework. Um, just bring attention to 3.3. Um, there are two programmes in the strategy um, which uh, are managed within the team, which is Inspire to Work and Inspire to Achieve, which are funded through a European uh, Structural Fund. And we will be taking um, a report to um, Economy and Development. Thank you, I always get that wrong. Um, <laughs> Um, to, to secure some more match funding to take those um, projects forward because as you can see from the report if we weren't to take those forward then obviously we have concerns at the number of needs that would increase. Um, 
option appraisal is quite self-explanatory. In terms of evaluation, um, this is critical. So we've taken the strategy, as you'll see from the consultation section, to um, Will's DMT, to Kath Fallon's DMT, um, to our post-16 steering group. We've met with our head teachers. We've, we've discussed with young people. So we would like to bring an annual report back here for, for you to, to see how the, the strategy is performing, to see whether we've met the targets within the strategy. Um, as the chair said, our strategy was very out of date, or well, it, it just looked completely out of date in terms of the way it was written, the way um, the content. We followed the um, Monmouthshire County Council template in pulling the strategy together, working with our key partners. Um, <coughs> And we don't want to be complacent either, really. You know, year on year, we've had a reduction in the number of uh, school leavers in year 11, 12, and 13 um, who are neat. But at the same time, we've um, worked with, with Will and Sharon and set in some targets for the next three years, um, looking at the, the cohorts of young people and looking at kind of what the challenges are going to be. In terms of resource implications, as I alluded to, there is um, match funding for two of the projects that will impact on the strategy, but there are uh, no other direct resource needs currently needed. Um, we've carried out the, the wellbeing assessment, um, so the strategy is in place for a more direct and coherent and added value approach for what we've got on offer. But we do understand that some of our young people face multiple barriers and challenges and there are some young people sometimes we just can't reach. Um, the impact, as I said earlier, is around the year 11, 12, and 13 levers, and the targets are on page 14 of the strategy. And then we're looking at young people 16 to 25 who are unemployed as well. So within the pack is the evaluation, the future generations value, and the actual strategy. I think that's it for me, really. It's just over to you if you have any questions. Jim. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Mr. Fowler. <clears throat> Hi. Um, so you, you said that the previous strategy, the 2015-2018, is um, out of date and it's essential to create the new strategy. Um, so what lessons did we learn from the last one? What did work? What didn't work? And um, what's new with this new strategy, I guess, uh, as kind of a, a start of a 10? Um, if I was being totally honest, I felt the last strategy was quite fluffy. It wasn't direct, it didn't have set targets in it. I felt that perhaps the ownership wasn't on some of our partners, in a sense where we've written it in terms of actions, we've engaged with our partners more on this, we've engaged with our schools. And I suppose, for me, is looking at in terms of real terms. We would we, we were doing okay into the, the old strategy, but I just felt that it didn't it didn't embrace everything that we were doing as partners, if that makes sense. And having an action plan now which has some clear set indicators performance and that'll link internally to our our, our SIP and um, and to other partners as well. I just We've had some really positive feedback from schools on it and from other partners, and I just feel that where we were was good, but where we need to be now needs to be even better, really. Thank you very much indeed. And, and I have to say from the chair that it was lovely to hear you talking about measurable targets. You know, we're, we're, once you've got smart targets in place, then you can say, yes, we know we did, were effective because, so, so well done. Um, Councillor Thomas. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think it's very important that, that we have an up-to-date policy in this area. These youngsters are probably the most challenging in, in a secondary school, uh, but also a post-school as well, and when they're not readily going into employment because they lack um, the skills, the social skills, the, the job skills, uh, to be able to move to an, into an employment easily. Uh, and I, I think... I commend the policy and I think we've got to have a, a firm policy in place to support these youngsters because th these are youngsters who are at a major disadvantage. They're not leaving with, with a string of, of A stars at GCSE or, or, or A level. Um, they're probably leaving with, with 
fairly minimal qualifications and anything we can do to to support them and get them into employment is, is obviously you know worthwhile I, I would commend it strongly but I agree with the chair there must be uh, positive targets to be able to measure this policy against this uh, strategy uh, without that it, 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 it's, it's, it's not really uh, there's not much point having it and we must revisit it and see what, what is actually happening in a year's time um, Councillor Powell thank you chairman um, as, as I've said before, I think we need to try and concentrate on getting help for these pupils and not for them to be blinded by the others that are going on to university and getting GCSEs, uh, GCSEs and all that, because I myself actually haven't got one to my name. So, um, you know, so we don't, we don't all go down, down, you know. So I think they need people to come into the schools um, to help them find what they're interested in. Um, I, I knew of a young man who just couldn't quite make the grades in GCSE and he was struggling. And then he went to a college instead and somebody saw his potential. And within two years, he was going great guns at, at something, um, you know, a, every, a everyday job, as you might say. There are an awful lot of people about the moment waiting for plumbers and carpenters and all this to come and do work in their houses. And if we can encourage um, that, uh, I know a lot of small companies can't afford to employ many people, but if we can encourage them to take on these, these youngsters and at least give them some sort of training to, so that they can find something they are able to do and which they feel happy doing, and it gives them self-respect rather than just sort of thinking, well, I can't do anything, what am I going to do? Because they get really down. And, and I hope that through the, uh, the schools this can be furthered. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Powell. Um, I think it's really important within the strategy we celebrate the successes of our young people. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this week on the Herb, there's Declan Story, who's gone through programmes with us, being supported by Monmouth Comp, and then he's won the uh, Trainership of the Year, which is phenomenal. And I think what the strategy do will, will demonstrate those successes, looking at individual potential and open doors, really. OK, any other comments? Uh, Mr. Fowler, and, th and then Councillor Brown. Uh, hi. Um, I just want to get into a bit of the nitty-gritty in there now. So I'm looking at, um, on page 61, the early identification tool. Uh, just looking at some of those metrics, it, it doesn't seem necessarily balanced in, in the weighting of some of the scores. Um, so I can see that... Um, I'm, I'm looking particularly at the attendance and the unauthorised attendance. So if we consider that a week's unauthorised leave, parents decide to take you on a week's leave, that's roughly 3% of your attendance. So that already gives you a score of 3 on the metrics. Now, if that child also happens to be an ALN child, they've scored 5 already and they're already at some risk. Um, and there could be absolutely nothing in that because it could be a child from an affluent family going on a skiing holiday who is autistic. Um, and so you're already identifying. So it seems that the unauthorised attendance is skewing the figures quite wildly as opposed to some of the other metrics where we're looking that move school twice. Well, yes, that is going to have an impact on their education or English as an additional language. I mean, that could be. And then looking at the attainment of their... Um, qualifications that's hugely impactful but the attendance although important to attend school it seems to be getting higher weightings and would seem to skew uh, the tool a bit I, it just looked a bit of a concern um thank you for picking up that councillor fowler um we've we've run this tool now for um a number of years and what what happens we we run the indicators and as you say we've we've kind of scrutinized attendance behavior and looking at whether it reflects what you know the that need of the pupil for their intervention through the program with us so it the the data set goes is is shows us one area of that pupil and what's going on and then what's key is the conversations we have with the schools then whether they need whether that pupil does need a further intervention 
picking up on on what you've said really you know we we've we've trialed it we've looked at other models we've looked at good practice um each authority in wales does it differently which doesn't help sometimes um but we feel the tool is working and if you speak to our secondary schools they would they would probably say the same at this current moment in time any further points? Uh, Councillor, oh, sorry, I, I, I called in Councillor Brown and, and then Councillor Jones. Councillor Brown. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I think that uh, looking at the policy, it obviously it covers um, 16 to 24-year-olds. And um, in terms of the indicators on page 61, um, it obviously seems to be... Um, uh, based on, um, you know, in a sense, a captured audience in terms of the schools, because you can find this data f fairly um, easily, and it's obviously sort of the 16-year-olds who are um, in in more need because of various factors. And um, you know, I appreciate that the priority has to be uh, towards those who um, are more in need of of obtaining uh, employment. But um, in general terms, the, there doesn't seem to be anything on the um, on the older age group, you know, so for example, um, if uh, graduates come, come back home and then can't find any work in Monmouthshire, you know, what help is available for them, what apprenticeships are available for them, and why are there so few apprenticeships available in Monmouthshire compared to everywhere else? You know, not only for those who find difficulty getting work, work but across the board between um, 16 and, and 24. And how can <clears throat> the council do something to improve that? I mean, are you... Um, actively going to local em employers and, and saying, you know, can you take on people at various various stages, you know, those who um, uh, are sort of more capable and less capable and so, and so forth. So it doesn't seem to be um, as if they're, um, you know, it obviously seems focused on an area that's easy to go for in a sense, but not necessarily covers the broad spectrum of those. And if we are aiming to keep young people in Monmouthshire, then obviously improving their opportunities is a good thing. The, the other question I've got is, is that in terms of apprenticeships, um, you know, I heard that some schools may, I mean, it wasn't, it was a general comment that I heard from somebody dealing with apprenticeships that, um, and it doesn't necessarily apply to Monmouthshire, but I don't know whether it does or it doesn't. But it was generally that the schools were reluctant to have um, uh, people in um, to talk about apprenticeships because the 16-year-olds who were capable of going on to A-levels in terms of school numbers, they wanted to keep them there. And, you know, apprenticeships might not only be a route for those who um, have difficulties at school, but also for the, um, for the more uh, capable. So what are we doing um, as a council? I mean, what apprenticeships does the council have, for example? Because one of the difficulties is, is if you're without work, is that you haven't got the work experience and um, so you can't get the job and you're caught in this catch-22 situation where you need the experience even if it's voluntary work and you know linking in with um, job centers and so forth but there does there doesn't seem to be any uh, careers advice out there to cover the whole age range and it looks like you're capturing a needy group but not necessarily covering the whole neat spectrum Thank you for your comments. I think I've I've got uh, the main points. Picking up in terms of employment, uh, you said about the 16 to 24 year olds. On page um, 11 of the strategy is the the figures for for that cohort. Um, what happens is if a young person leaves school at at 16. Um, the data is then um, from the school over to Careers Wales. So Careers Wales will track those young people um, and we meet on a monthly basis, multi-agency, it's happening today, and we discuss those young people, look at what, you know, what their barriers are um, and we look at putting action plans in place. Um, you'll probably see from the data, um, tier two is young people that 
are unable to engage or we can't reach and um, we are concerned you'll see from the figures there that these figures aren't uh, aren't reducing currently at the moment and this is um, across other local authorities as well we have our inspire to work program which works for young people around employability skills but um, Welsh Government now will be bringing in Work in Wales which is um, it's going to be a, a new scheme which is going to be taken over from the old sort of YTS scheme. I say YTS because that was my era, which is now called traineeship scheme, where we're looking at how we can support some of the young people with, with the multiple barriers. Um, picking up on your apprenticeships, we currently have 14 apprentices in Monmouthshire County Council. We recently celebrated National Apprenticeship Week back in March. Um, I don't know if you saw the video clips on the hub. One of our primary schools, um, to still, I guess, currently five apprentices, which is fantastic. Um, we have met with procurement um, quite recently, looking at the, the supply chains in Monmouthshire and look at whether there could be some clauses within those suppliers to see whether there could be some apprenticeship opportunities. Um, we've, I was approached yesterday for two work placements within the local authority. Um, we will be running a series of um, articles again on the hub to to look at how um, depart, you know to to raise awareness of the value of having an apprentices in 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 departments and what what skill sets they can bring. Really picking up on your points in terms of the number of apprentices in Monmouthshire. I understand that apprenticeships can be low compared to other authorities, but I think, I suppose my mic, isn't it? It's got a bit of interference. <laughs> um, Carry on, I don't know. It's just, it hasn't got a, a what do you call it on it? A fluffy bit, yeah. Um, is with the city deal now and there's new opportunities coming on board um e apprentice has met with kath fallon this morning who's one of the chairs they're recognizing there needs to be more opportunities for our young people in monmouthshire picking up on your other point um action five is all around employability so it is around employability for all although you know we talk traditionally as needs as young people that are vulnerable sometimes that not is not the case you know young people as you say may go to university or um feel that the offer they currently got post 16 isn't for them so i do pick up on some of your points i hope that answers some of your questions sorry my mic you want to come back, yeah. Councillor Brown? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, because of obviously graduate unemployment and so forth, you know, the, the, there is um, a, a difficulty in finding work af after graduation, you know, not only having the larger debt as well. Um, but um, I don't know whether or not um, our schools, as, as I say, encourage not only the um, pupils who are, are vulnerable, uh, but also the other ones to uh, consider apprenticeships. Um, you know, from talking to other local parents, you know, this seems quite a, a, a good route, route for people. Not only do they, um, uh, you know, avoid the, the, the debt that they get from going to university, but also they get the experience and training that is, is geared to, to the actual job and, and I don't know the question the answer to the question and um, and perhaps the chief uh, education officer can answer this one um, how welcoming are the um, schools to talk about apprenticeships um, not only in relation to those who are leaving at 16 but also those who may be thinking of um, you know going on between uh, 16 and, and 18 to a level so that you're talking about sort of the more traditional, um, basically earlier um, sort of A-level training uh, scheme that was, you, you know, more in place um, previously, but um, you know had the advantage of um, uh, obtaining local work for 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 local um, youth. Really, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, we've discussed this with the four secondary schools. I've also discussed it with the principal of College Gwent um, about how we broaden um, uh, students uh, kind of range of expectations and where they think they might look to go um, both post 16 and post 18 in school um, I think there is at the moment still a kind of a general drift that people think that HE um, is their kind of preferred destination we're still seeing significant numbers of children progress through to HE um, I think one of the things which has been really interesting is 
the extent of competition for those high level apprenticeships. They are far more um, competitive um, than actually many places for university, interestingly. So I think the high level apprenticeships at some of our biggest uh, employers, the biggest engineering firms and so on, um, attract huge, huge numbers. So they're very, very competitive in terms of uh, students being able to access those. Um, it is something that we'll continue to look at. Uh, it's a key part of the city deal agenda, identifying those future industries and identifying the types of skills that students need now and able to, to access those as well. So it's a key part of the considerations that we are engaged with, with the four secondaries and with Guy um, and colleagues in Colleg Gwent. Thank you very much. Uh, any further comments or questions? Uh, <coughs> Councillor Jones, yes, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, looking at Appendix 3 and the figures that are quoted for 2018, 2019 and so on, am I assuming correctly that 2018, 2019 are the current year 10 pupils in schools? And then we go down to year 9 and year 8? Yes, the, um, the year is, is yeah, the yeah, academic year. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, so in that case then, uh, to point out to fellow councillors that these pupils are being supported from year eight in order to uh, to help them achieve um, uh, qualifications training and mm -hmm. to avoid becoming a neat mm -hmm. so therefore there's a, a, a reason and um, a need to congr congratulate all the staff in schools in carrying out the work that they do with pupils in order to set them on the right track and there's unfortunately still a small number of pupils in single figures i think eights and nines that are falling through the net but um it just goes to show the level of disaffection and probably trouble that these pupils are experiencing in falling through the net and uh, the effort of the schools is paramount in trying to avoid that and um, it's uh, one of those pluses the schools don't get credit for i believe thank you okay thank you Thank you very much. Um, if we draw to a, a conclusion uh, on this discussion, then, um, the recommendations ask us to uh, consider the new uh, draft strategy before it goes to uh, Cabinet. I, I think the only comment that we might add to it is, is, is Councillor Brown's comment that we should be looking to increase, as far as possible, the number of apprenticeships within the Council. Uh, and I think that was a point well made, Councillor Brown. Um, but if I, if I could um, thank Miss Jones for a, really a, a very detailed report here, and it is nice to see an officer actually uh, responding to a question about how can you tell us this is an improvement on the previous one and being able to give us very clear reasons why this is a smarter, more objective policy that we're being asked to approve. Do you want to make any final comments before we move on? Oh, sorry, Councillor Brown. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add, yeah, certainly on, on apprenticeships across the board, you know, um, basically for 16 to 24 year olds, um, either with or without qualifications will be um, helpful. But I think also if the um, council could do sort of more work experience weeks, I don't know whether it actually does that, but that's also very helpful for anybody's CV, you know, because I know... Um, uh, my children when they were going through I don't know whether it happens here but I know that my children also um, had um, as part of their schooling you know a week or two's work experience with a local em employer and I don't know whether that happens and um, you know whether the council off offers those opportunities or local employers do but that's a good thing for somebody to have on their CV that they've actually been out and done something even if it's only for a week or two. Uh, and I know the health and safety if they're under 16 and all these issues, but it's still very helpful for them. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor. It's very topical because I had um, um, two inquiries yesterday for work placements, work experience. So we will be looking to um, develop a toolkit. Um, not all our secondary schools offer work experience traditionally, as, as you said. Monmouth and Caldicott do. Um, young people um, go out on extended work experience, sometimes in Key Stage 4. But, um, yeah, we we have had a few offers lately, and we will be looking to, to raise awareness of those opportunities within the authority. Yes, we'll have to put, the obviously, the, the correct processes in check as well. 
Okay, well, again, thank you very much for coming along this morning. We note that you will be reporting to us annually, which again is an improvement and enables us to keep a, a close tab on what you're doing. But uh, again, I think, uh, members, an, another uh, essentially good news story here. Uh, and long may continue for the rest of this meeting. Uh, thank you very much indeed. If we can move on then to agenda item nine, which is um, our, our director talking to us about the ALN uh, review that has been going on and, and the potential need to just knock it back another month. But uh, Mr. McLean, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I have a presentation that uh, I can use with the committee this morning. Um, I hope committee members have also had a chance to have a look at the Cabinet paper um, that is going to Cabinet next Wednesday. Uh, in essence, this is a, a good opportunity for, for me to, to update you. Um, last time we were together, uh, it was very useful in that uh, your questions and comments on the ALN review itself um, were able to be fed into the formal consultation. And I'll pick up um, through this presentation where we've got to in terms of our considerations. I don't know if it's come up on the screen, is it? And Oh, you have my emails, um, which is probably not what you want. <laughs> there we are. Excellent. That's there. Always Councillor Thomas. Um, okay. So, um, okay. So, background, uh, which you'll all be aware of, of course. Um, 7th of uh, March this year, Cabinet gave us approval uh, to engage in this statutory consultation process around a new delivery model for ALN. Um, just to remind you very briefly as to what that proposal was, it was to establish a new special school across the county um, with a full range of provision for children to meet the needs of um, young people aged 3 to 19 um, with autistic spectrum disorder, social, emotional, behavioural difficulties, um, the PMLD, which is uh, profound multiple learning difficulties and severe learning difficulties within the county. Um, it also had some um, very significant impacts on Mountain House Special School, um, which would have closed as a consequence of the proposal that was being considered. Um, furthermore, the new special school would offer provision um, for a wide range um, of students, meaning that children would be able to have their needs met locally. Um, that was really important to us. Um, and we would be in enhancing and developing the support that uh, our pupil referral service was able to, to offer to children who were at risk of exclusion. Uh, in terms of the engagement process and in terms of the consultation, um, it started on the 16th of April. Um, it ran for the statutory six-week period. It concluded on the 27th of May. Um, and all of the statutory consultees were uh, targeted um, and provided with access to all of the consultation documents. So it went to everybody, um, all of our neighbouring authorities, um, authorities who place children in our schools and so on. So the whole kind of gambit had the opportunity to respond. We also um, did face-to-face -face consultation and engagement events with children and young people, um, with staff, with governing bodies and with parents. Um, and we did that in all of the schools that were affected by the proposals. Um, and those were those uh, uh, four, five, six, uh, nine schools there, which are on that slide. Um, they were, in some instances, very well attended. In other instances, not so well attending. Um, depending on, I think, what parents in particular perceive to be the, uh, the challenges um, of the changes for those, their children. Um, uh, but I uh, was very grateful to uh, the, the, the warm welcomes we received from all of our schools. Um, staff really keen to be involved and understand the, the changes and so on. Uh, it's worth remembering that there's really significant change with regards to additional learning needs um, with the new Act now in place. Um, the really significant development, though, will be the publication of the Code of Conduct, um, no, the Code of Practice, and I want to stop getting those muddled up, uh, the Code of Practice, which will be published uh, in autumn this year. So that's, um, that's when we will see very clearly written down what the change in expectation is in terms of the way that uh, children with additional learning needs are supported. 
Um, in addition to those face-to-face um, -face events, we did receive extensive uh, written responses, so 39 written responses, um, 13 from parents, 7 from staff members, 6 from governors or governing bodies, um, depending, uh, 12 from different organisations, some of those representative, um, the Welsh Society for Children um, who are hard of hearing and so on, um, but also um, important bodies such as um, ESTIN and SNAP, and SNAP is the organisation that acts as advocate for families whose children have additional learning needs so they're really important that we have them on board um, obviously we had a response from yourselves at the last meeting um, and we had two with the sub uh, that were submitted anonymously um, so what did the feedback tell us which I guess is the the crunch point of today's discussion the the consultation um, did identify a, a wide range of positive views about the changes that we were proposing. Um, and on balance, um, the evidence was that it was more um, in support of the new model than that was against it. So I think that's a really positive uh, piece for us to take from the, the exercise, first of all. However, um, as with any properly run consultation process, it did identify a range of questions that we need to address um, if it's to be successful in the future. Uh, and that comes to the kind of the key point that the chair has alluded to uh, in that we are going to we are going to ask Cabinet um, next Wednesday if we can have an additional month, which will allow us the full period of the summer, plus some extra time with the schools in the uh, very early part of the next term uh, to reflect on some of the things they told us so that we're not just pushing on blindly with our suggestion, but actually we refine that and amend that to make sure that it's fit for purpose um, for what the schools think. So um, just in first up in terms of the positives, um, very clearly coming out... Um, the, the, the inclusive aspiration um, of the ALN review came out as a very clear positive, um, I think, from virtually every sector. You know, people were very, very clear that they wanted children with additional learning needs or challenging behaviours to be given the opportunity for as far as they possibly could to be educated in settings with the rest of their peers. And that was a, a critical one. Um, the enhancement of support to schools through the delivery of on-site inclusion centres um, was seen as a good thing. We are quite often, um, particularly for our secondary schools, um, uh, there's a concern that um, there's a bit of a, a cliff edge in terms of our support in terms of children who are at risk of inclusions. So the schools are expected to do an awful lot with children to keep them in school, and then suddenly there's a step then into um, kind of pre supported um, learning. What this offered us was a kind of a really good position whereby the school would have very clear expectations in terms of placed upon them by us um, through yourselves um, in terms of our expectations of what children um, should expect from school, but what school should expect of children in terms of behaviour. When that reached a point, it would allow um, them to be taken from the school setting, but remain um, within that environment, as it were. So there would be inclusion centres within each school um, that would take the pressure off the school and would remove that kind of that whole piece, which is around um, them becoming a barrier to other children's learning, which is often one of the key kind of critiques, um, but would be a, um, a position short of full engagement with the pupil referral service. So that was uh, very positively re um, um, received. Um, the third point is around um, the fundamental aspect around early intervention. It is the key tenant of the new Act that children's needs are identified as early as they possibly can be, that really effective teaching and learning strategies are put in place to support those children, and that that therefore means that those needs should not become greater and more acute um, as time goes on. Um, we also recognise that we will have to invest in our mainstream teaching um, staff because they will have to do more in the classroom under the new Act. So that was really important. Um, and that aligns very clearly to national and regional models of practice which are developing. Um, and the final point was this notion around us not keeping in kind of separate silos um, children who have got additional learning needs and children who have got um, behavioural needs. Um, very, very often, um, well, in fact, in every case, I would suggest, um, children with very real challenging behaviour have that 
because of either an underlying um, additional learning need that might not have been identified as yet, um, because what people see first of all is the presentation of challenging behavior and not what might actually be behind it, or trauma in early life. Um, and that will be the cause of what's presenting. And I think we've got to recognize actually that uh, how children, um, what children experience at home, in their community and so on, has a very, very real impact on how they behave when they get into the school situation. But I think for, for some professionals, and this is clearly the case, um, there is always, there's been a, a slight kind of differentiation in that, uh, you know, for children, we've got additional learning needs and we'll do our best to support them. And then there are the troublesome children. But this actually was about bringing equity and recognising the challenges that those children with behavioural difficulties actually faced and what caused those. However, and it would be completely um, wrong of me to kind of infer it wasn't the case, there were some negatives uh, in terms of the feedback uh, and we have to reflect on those. So in terms of the negatives, um, the first one that came up everywhere we went um, was that there was a concern for staff in the existing settings about how the management um, interface would work between the special school um, and the mainstream school. Um, that's a very fair question to be asked. Um, we were very clear with all of the schools that actually there would have to be an extended period of joint working so that everybody knew and understood and designed protocols and procedures together so that those wouldn't be issues. Um, but as I say, it was a very fair um, comment um, from colleagues. Interestingly, um, during the um, consultation period, I went to meet uh, a former colleague of ours um, who's now a head teacher in a special school in Newport in Maisebu. Um, she was talking about the way that Maisebu works uh, with regards to the schools in Newport but she also was reflecting on a school in North Wales um, where there is um, a satellite unit of a special school within um, a mainstream secondary school and how that model works. Um, she was saying that model worked very well in North Wales. Um, so it's not impossible, but I think we need to take a little bit of time just to reflect on that and make sure that we're not asking our professional colleagues um, to do something which is unworkable. The second point um, was regard to the equity of our proposal. Um, the, as we go forward with education in Monmouthshire, we will see ever more clusters being the basis of much of the work. So I've no doubt we will be back uh, in front of this committee to talk about the, uh, the rollout of um, the new curriculum very near, in the very near future. Um, clusters will be the mainstay of that development. Um, one of the critiques that came back was that even though we had a mirrored north and south provision map we didn't have it um, there wasn't an equitable split across the four clusters so for instance in the north of the county both of the SNRBs in the proposed map are in Monmouth rather than Abergavenny so children from Abergavenny are still going to have to travel away from their cohort and their peers and their community to access schooling um, now there are clearly cost imperatives um, and just well not imperatives rather you know a cost pressure that would stop us being able to provide in every single cluster. But that was a key point uh, that came up there. So although we're doing it in county, actually within county in a county as big as Monmouthshire could be a further than an out of county placement. And that was something that came back. Um, we did have um, some questions, I guess of a technical nature around the designations for some of the um, SNRB centres um, and about whether those centres would be appropriately um, equipped and prepared um, for children. Um, I guess this is at the at the, the kind of the highest levels of need and if we think about um, we talked about the um, provision for children with profound and multiple learning difficulties um, as I said, I spent some time in my Cebu and, you know, the provision they have there for the very small number of children, about six or seven children, I think, um, who have profound and multiple learning difficulties, you know, the equipment, the setting is, is hugely extensive. So you're talking about children who might require three different types of wheelchair in a day, um, require medical care, changing, um, hoists, all of that type of things. And I think we need to reflect upon whether our settings are actually set up for that and whether they've got the necessary um, um, even the space necessary with additional investment to meet those needs and in truth and it's a, a kind of key question what would those children gain 
from being in mainstream setting and what would those children within the mainstream school gain from those children being in their setting as well and that's a kind of a key question for us to try and resolve. The penultimate point on this uh, slide um, is around moderate learning difficulties. Uh, moderate learning difficulties is um, the designation that is um, attached to um, our current SNRB, our live SNRB in the secondary in the south of the county. Um, it's going to become a, an area of real challenge for us in the future because the new Act is very clear um, that moderate learning difficulties is not a designation that should require a statement. Well, statements will go, but um, is not a designation that, will, that should require a child to be educated in an SNRB. So that's about us looking at professional teaching practice around differentiation in the classroom, around excellent teaching and learning. Um, but it is quite a significant area for us to engage with parents on because in the past we have used our SNRBs to support children with moderate learning difficulties. Parents are rightly concerned that that provision might be taken away from them. And how do we engage in that in making sure that people are confident that actually the provision that they are going to receive in mainstream is actually as good and better than that that they received in an SNRB unit. So there are real kind of areas around that. That was something that will come out um, when we see the new code of practice. Um, and it will be a challenge right across um, all of Wales, how we deal with the MLD part. Um, the final point there is one specifically um, around the Mountain House site. Um, at the moment, we are unable to provide support for children in county who have social, emotional, behavioural difficulties that are not boys or of secondary age. That's a huge shortcoming on our part. We know that SEBD is a growing area of need. We also know that um, associated with it um, is an autistic spectrum disorder in a very, very um, frequent occurrence. Um, we want to be able to provide um, for all of those children. There were some very fair practical questions asked of us about how the changes would take place in Mountain House to ensure that everybody was safe and everyone was cared for in an appropriate way. And we take those on board absolutely uh, and we will look to make sure that, uh, that we resolve those. Um, fundamentally to me it still feels wrong that uh, if you're a, uh, a girl who's experiencing um, social emotional behavioural difficulties um, we cannot provide for you in county and that's a really fundamental point around equity in terms of our children in the county. So I said a couple of slides ago that on balance it was a more positive consideration. I've just realised that, you know, in those two slides it probably looks more weighed to a negative one. Um, that's probably just in terms of the drafting on my part. Um, so, but it brings me back to that key point in that there were, um, the direction of travel I think was endorsed as the right thing. The ambition was endorsed as the right thing. I think the part that people were asking around, you know, and certainly, um, the, the first and the last bullet point on that were around very practical considerations um, around what does implementation look like, how will you do that. Because of that, we have asked and we will be asking Cabinet for that additional time in the autumn term for us to develop through the summer holidays and then to engage again with schools uh, post-summer holidays. So if I just set out the, the next steps, which I've alluded to throughout this morning's um, brief update. Um, so the informal feedback report, um, it's formal report, but it's informal in the sense that it's not uh, the full consultation report will go next week. Um, within the statutory timeline, the full consultation response, which is i.e. all of the consultation responses we had and our response to them, uh, will be available by the 19th of August. Um, we're then going to take this additional time to reflect um, on some of the things which we've learned during that period of time. Um, and then we will report back in the autumn um, what we feel should happen um, to Cabinet. Um, and as I say, that final decision, rather than being on the 5th of November, will be on the 5th of December. I'm happy to take any questions that might be, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Mr McLean. Uh, two points from the Chair before we, we kick off. The first is that uh, I would ask members not to go back to basics and make points about uh, 
the type of provision we might make because we did that at our last meeting and it was good to hear Mr McLean saying that our deliberations had been included in the paperwork. So, so we've done that, we've had that bite of the cherry. Uh, the second thing is that uh, some of us here are members of governing bodies who have been consulted and, and therefore I think to be absolutely clear if we are going to make a comment, we need to declare a non-prejudicial uh, interest as a, a member of a governing body. We, we've had one already for a dairy view, but uh, I would say only if you're going to speak could you, at, at the start of your comments, make that declaration that you are a member of the governing body and it is non-prejudicial. Um, one sm small comment, uh, a question fr from the chair, and then I'll throw it open. Uh, your slide there, it, it, it talked about, on balance, the, um, the, the views were, were positive. Well, well 51.49 is on balance, and we've seen elsewhere that uh, that actually makes uh, for things that are far from easy. Where are we, not being specific, but how heavily balanced were, were the positives and negatives? Uh Oh, sorry. Um, what I was seeking to describe about being on balance with the practical considerations of some of the implementational aspects. So I think in terms of direction, it was probably, I would say, strongly 80% or so were, were in support. Um, and interestingly, some key bodies, so Snap Cymru came back very positively in terms of support. Um, however, it's, for me, it's about managing that expectation around the direction of travel being right, but making sure that implementation happens in a, in a positive and constructive way that means we take everybody with us. And that's the balance we're trying to reflect. Right. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, uh, Mr Fowler. Hi, um, I think it's very prudent to take the extra month uh, because taking a project of this size, it's worth getting it right first time rather than um, trying to rush some, something through. Um, and with that in mind, um, have we got enough time to fully analyse the new code of practice to make sure that we've got the right implementation of that into this plan? Or is this something that we're going to have to revisit once we know more from the new ALN bill? That's a, a really a fair question. I think where we are, we need to change to make sure that we're ready for the new code of practice. Um, I think um, we can't, we'd always be waiting because it will be a draft in, um, you know, and it's, you know, it's, uh, I think at the moment everyone kind of says, oh, well, we're expecting it in the autumn. Well, the autumn could quite easily turn into the, you know, and there's a risk around that. So I think it's, um, it's right for us to, to move now. Um, the code of practice is something that all local authorities will be um, challenged by, I think it's fair to say. Um, we're working very, very closely with our other four regional partners across Gwent. Um, Welsh Government has appointed a transformational lead, Tracy Peed, who was formerly head of ALN in Torvine. Um, she's working across. Um, we've recently undertaken um, a state of readiness assessment for the, for the new act. Um, when, and people are trying to distill from the Act what the Code of Practice will say. So we're making all the arrangements on one path to make sure we're ready for the legislation. I think this is about getting our house in order to be ready for it. Okay. Uh, Councillor Powell. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, coming back again to the fact that um, uh, the girls aren't going to be, you know, we haven't got anywhere for the girls in this difficulty, they still have to go out of county. What is the future of that? What is, there, is there any light at the end of the tunnel to find provision for our girls? Um, with regard to our girls, um, what normally happens at the moment is that we place um, in um, Headlands, um, which is a school in Penarth, um, or in Talica, which is an independent setting in the north of the county. Um, there are, for, for us on one level, and you know, we talk about outturn later on this morning, there are cost implications around that. Um, but it's really about, on an equitable basis, us saying you know, we need a provision for all of our students. So that is definitely one which we are seeking to do. Um, I think 
the, the mountain house is a key consideration of this development, um, and it's one which we'll seek to resolve as soon as we can. What I don't want anybody to go away with the, the impression of, though, is that girls who have those needs are not having those needs met. They are having their needs met, but it's just in places that we would rather them be met within our, our authority. I forgot to declare the interest at the start, declare interest. I'm a governor at King Henry School. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fowler, could you turn your mic off? Thanks. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Councillor Brown. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, at the last committee um, uh, was very uh, positive about the uh, developments, but um, there were some assurances that were put forward um, in the minutes about various issues. And when I was looking at uh, 3.7 of the um, uh, areas of concern, um, it does, did say the proposal for mixed gender, full age range provision with ASD and SE. BD on the same site raised some concerns both in terms of safety of pupils and general management arrangements. Well, I think within that, um, uh, it also ought to have a comma PRU after the SEB, SEBD, because one of the concerns was about the management of uh, the, the PRU unit because of the fact that, um, in a sense, um, that was uh, the SEBD was a more extreme end of the continuum in terms of behaviour. And, you, you know, you didn't want any learning experience in relation to uh, SE, SEB type of behaviour to influence um, PR, PRU behaviour. And that obviously that's the general management of the, um, the mountain uh, school site and how you how you, you actually sort that out. The other issue is, is in uh, 3.7, it talks about the um, sp special needs uh, resource base centres. I think they are probably better to remain within the satellite schools myself, just because of the fact that, um, you know, there are already issues with regard to general management arrangements on the Mountain House site. Um, in relation to um, the, the last bullet point in 3.7. And obviously, if you then have uh, combined that with um, uh, SNRB on the same site, you've got, you know, virtually the management arrangement for, for the teaching and so forth becomes uh, quite complicated. The, the other issue that um, I wanted to um, ask about was that you mentioned that you thought that um, ASD and SEBD, which is um, autistic spectrum disorder and social emotional behavior difficulties, how they were often combined, but presumably they aren't always combined. And I don't know what percentage of pupils do have both, but um, I have been told that, that there is a difference in the type of um, teaching that you give um, the, the different sorts of pupils. Um, just to take a very simple example, um, uh, apparently uh, if you told uh, uh, an ASD uh, pupil to go and join this uh, school bus and it was issued as a a type of order, you wouldn't necessarily get the right response. They may um, turn around and, and you, you'd be better to actually say to them, oh, it'd be a good idea if you join the bus because they're about to leave, you know, a more gentle approach. Whereas with SEBD, there might be sort of a more, um, you know, you better join the bus and obviously the mountain school, I've looked in the details of the site and it looks like they, the method of teaching in terms of um, things like, um, you know, a, a, a more more disciplined type of approach and a reward system for for good behaviour and so forth. So I, I'm I'm not quite sure how these these two can possibly be man managed. But obviously, not every ASD is also SEBD, and you know, so. It's also also a question of how um, you sort out the not only the general management arrangements, but also how you sort out a more 
complicated teaching arrangement. And really, in this, I'm talking about what what is um, you know best for the for the needs of the pupils that you're actually dealing with and obviously that must be you know in in terms of pupil welfare that must be uh, uh you know a, a primary education uh concern council Brad, could, could i interject slightly and just say this is the longest question i've ever heard i think could could you could you just yeah. make the point uh, and let, let our director respond? yeah it's just just a very to, to summarize is just um about um the general management arrangements for the different needs and also the um question about um keeping the the neighbors aware of what's going on because i think that's something that we was mentioned when i went along to the evening at mountain house school so sorry if I've gone on a little bit, but I suppose it was trying to explain to the um, perhaps people who haven't heard of, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but I, I do understand that there are some differences in approach with the different type of pupils that you're looking at. Thank you, Councillor Brown. I think you're absolutely right um, to recognise the fact that, um, you know, the, the site itself will, will require some careful consideration about how we manage that site and we'll have to be very aware in terms of the range of uh, of needs uh, that are within that site and that's absolutely right and that's um, part of that management um, your your point around a ASD and SEVD is is right to a certain extent I guess um, in a sense that there will be children um, in our mainstream schools now who have um, are somewhere on that spectrum because that's what uh, um, the, the S is, is around. And they will cope brilliantly in mainstream school. And our mainstream schools do a tremendous piece of work with those children. There's no question around that. Um, what we're talking about here is that there are a group of children and an increasing number of children who have a diagnosis, um, so a professional um, diagnosis, of SEBD and ASD. So we wouldn't be talking about children who had a singular diagnosis of ASD being then placed into the setting that we're talking about creating in Mountain House. They would continue to have their needs net either in one of our mainstream schools or in one of the places that we commission in specific support units for children with higher levels of need around ASD. So that wouldn't be an issue. So this isn't um, a kind of um, all one size fits all into that place and that would be entirely wrong i think your reflections about teaching are hugely uh, important i think you know we have to always have at the forefront of our mind that actually what drives standards what drives improvement is excellent teaching that is an irreducible fact and it's been really positive to see the work that mountain house have done on adapting and changing their curriculum model to make sure that their students can actually access the curriculum to a far greater extent than in other places and i think that's been really positive um, so you're absolutely right that we think about um, the management in a very clear way that's why i've referenced it in one of the key concerns that came back out um, um, but yes, as well, the teaching aspect is important. Councillor Watkins. Oh, sorry. Um... Yeah, just a, a quick question. Could you explain then why um, this uh, last bullet point in 3.7, why that was made? Because it, it seems as if what you're saying is you're only talking about ASD combined with SEBD, but this doesn't seem to be clear in the sentence so i didn't this is why i raised this issue thank you councillor brown where are you referring to 3.7 sorry uh, page yeah sorry page the last bullet point um on page 68 under 3.7 sorry 3.7 of the cabinet, oh, the cabinet paper, paper yeah all oh, right okay yeah. um okay i'll i won't do that now because i haven't got that in front of me so let me have a look at that and i'll come back to you if that's okay okay councillor watkins Thank you. Um, so in your presentation, you mentioned about the children with moderate learning difficulties and the fact that they're not going to be met in the SNRB settings any longer, and that you said that this is going to be in line with the code of practice, which obviously we haven't seen yet. So, um, and then you referenced um, needing for communication with parents to reassure them. So I'm now just a little bit confused as what are we planning to do for our children with moderate learning difficulties? Because um, we're now talking about removing them from the specialist help that they've been getting and saying that they have to manage in a mainstream classroom. 
with excellent teaching. But I am now just worried that we're going to be letting down those students. In terms of, you know, I think we, we, what we need to do is to be really clear about what a child's needs are. We need to understand really clearly um, where they have gaps in their skills and so on and what support they might need to do um, to improve those. I think what has been difficult is that we've ended up in a position whereby, however we try and describe this, it ends up in a very black and white perspective. So um, I'll try and describe a situation whereby um, children are supported in the mainstream um, and in a way through excellent teaching in the first instance, but through also um, some small group provision where children can be taken out and given additional support in some areas and so on. Um, but for other parts of the curriculum might be able to meet those in the full cohort. That seems to be then put, um, portrayed against a position whereby they are given 100% support in a base um, away from the mainstream. And I suspect that the truth actually lies and the right provision actually lies between those two. And there will be a sliding scale of support for children who have got moderate learning needs um, that goes from... Um, uh, kind of children who need to spend more, much more time in small group provision and so on, to children who can cope for the vast majority amount of time in um, a mainstream group with just some additional support. Um, I think we need to find a better way of describing that to people so that they are comforted, I think, by the fact that this is not about us um, on whole scale saying we're going to change what that unit is for um, and suddenly we're just going to move a group of children who have enjoyed and been supported um, in a very, very kind of um, full way previously into a set. And I think one of the comments um, and one of the questions I had from parents in one of our secondary schools was this notion around, um, you'll take my child who's been very kind of carefully supported and nurtured in a small group provision and put them in bottom set with naughty children. And that's, you know, we, that, that's something we, we've got to move that kind of language We've got to move away. We've got to get to a position whereby everybody understands, actually, that the provision of teaching is as good as it can be, no matter what set you're in, that behaviour is managed effectively in the school setting so that it doesn't become a disruptive influence on other children seeking to learn. But when children have got specific needs around some specific skills that they're seeking to develop, they always have the ability to have that resource there. I think... One of the things which will happen as we take this period of time to reflect a little bit is that we'll be able to present um, a more nuanced and a, um, a picture in terms of what it will look like. I think our recognition, I think, potentially that for children who have got profound and multiple learning difficulties, actually, you know, well, firstly, the numbers in Monmouthshire are very small. Um, so actually creating an infrastructure in, for them in our two schools would probably not be an efficient use of funding. So actually, you know, for them, their best place may still be out of county. And we were always very honest and upfront around the ALN side that for some children out of county would always be the, the best place for them. But this doesn't mean that suddenly on, you know, day one of September 2020 or September 2019, that those children will no longer be able to access that support. That support will remain there and that's fundamental to our kind of beliefs around an inclusive um, provision whereby all children achieve their best. So we need to find a better way of telling that story. Are you happy with that, Councillor Watkin? <laughs> Any other comments? Uh, Councillor Thomas and then uh, Councillor Harris. I'd just like to say briefly that, um, you know, I, I do have some, in a sense, concerns in, in terms of what uh, Mr McLean has, has, has just uh, outlined. In terms of teachers in mainstream, of, of having children you know, with particular needs there, it, unless they've got very good support. But also for, from, from the point of view of, of a child with special needs, being in mainstream in, in a comprehensive, it can be quite a tough place to be in a sense, if you've come from a, a, a more sort of supported uh, background. And, and you know, both ends of the spectrum, because what you want to see is well-supported youngsters, but also importantly as well, uh, well-supported teachers, because those teachers, have incredible pressures of getting results for for the the cohort that they're responsible for the class they're responsible for and I, it, it it does concern me a bit i've not taught for quite a while now but i, I did teach for nearly 20 years in in, in quite challenging uh, schools and that that does concern me somewhat i think 
Councillor Thomas, it's it's really about you're absolutely right about the support. And one of the things we've been really clear about is that in in all of the workings and all of the developments around how this uh, project has kind of um, evolved over time, at no point have we ever identified removing support from children. So children who have identified one to one support and so on, that will remain in place for them. There's there's been no question around that, and that plays no part in the financial resource that we've been looking at either. Um, you're right that uh, teachers um, are, you know, under huge amounts of pressure in terms of expectations, in terms of continuing drive for improvement and so on. Um, it's about us finding the right places for the children. That's the fundamental thing we do. That's what we're here to do. We're here to stand for them. And I think the key part for us is finding the right things. So it's about all the time thinking around what those graduated responses look like, be it behaviour, be it ALN. We've got to find those. So for, you know, if the graduated response for behaviour is very easily seen in that, you know, you have expectations around classroom management, around pastoral support, then potentially around inclusion support before PRU, um, and then, you know, the potential of a kind of a special school provision around SEBD. Um, for ALN children, it should be around excellent teaching. It should be around differentiation in the classroom. It should then be around additional support, additional interventions. And that's how we should begin to understand that. And that clarity should help both teachers and students achieve everything they want to. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you for letting me uh, come in. Just to reiterate, I am a, a governor of Derry View School that's got a, an SR at NB. Um, so just to reinforce that. Uh, I've only just, well, I haven't read the report. I only just got it this morning. So if I step over the line inadvertently, I hope you'll uh, <laughs> bear with me. Uh, basically, um, we, we know uh, that it's good for children with additional learning needs to stay within the community if that is possible. Um, but I know uh, from experience that it can sometimes take months and even years for a child with um, ASD or what's the other one, SE to be diagnosed meanwhile that child is within a school environment and as I say it can be there for years and uh, such children can be uh, uh, very uh, disruptive so I wonder what uh, Will has in mind for speeding up uh, diagnosis of because uh, that's critical you know if they're not diagnosed then they're uh, in mainstream and that then comes back to um, uh, leaving the moderate learning difficulties within um, uh, mainstream and of course we're then faced with um, uh, budget reductions and the loss of TAs in a, in a big way who are really critical for those children with the uh, moder moderate uh, learning difficulties. So I just wonder um, uh, about Will's thoughts uh, uh, along that line. And the other thing is, finally, we may be getting a, a, a 3 to 19 uh, through school in, uh, in Abergavenny and how much thought in this review has gone into um, uh, the provisions that could be provided there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Um, in terms of the, your first part of the question around um, early identification, as I said earlier, that's a key tenant um, of the new Act is around early identification. Um, we have in the proposal the creation of two early assessment centres, um, which will be staffed by um, specifically trained, and Derry View would be one of those sites. Um, that would enable children to come from their school into that assessment centre for a period of time, probably between four to six weeks, where they would be able to be observed on a daily basis by professionals to assess what their needs might be. Um, that would kind of get us over some of the challenges um, whereby, um, you know, I know we've got a, um, our 
the P team, um, they're under huge pressure in terms of demands placed on them by schools. Um, but very often, you know, they could go out to a school to see, you know, child A, um, who has been um, behaving in a certain way or struggling with some learning in a certain way. And they'll go that day and that child will be either angelic or kind of get the exercise straight away. And actually then that's that process. So in the creation of the assessment centres, we're able then to observe them over a longer period of time in a more intense way. One of the other key changes is that the statements will go as a part of the, the introduction of the new Act. The IDPs, which replace them, um, have a much um, tighter timeline. Uh, they need to be completed in 10 weeks as opposed to 26 for a statement. So actually that's a huge kind of pressure onto us. Um, and I was grateful this year that the um, uh, that the cabinet recognised that pressure um, and afforded us additional resources to prepare for that. And there's further um, identified pressure within the budget for the following year uh, to make sure that we're ready for the introduction of the new act. So that's absolutely fact. Um, with regards to the new school, um, yes, it's a key consideration. We're just in the very early stages of thinking what that looks like. Um, but um, it's my expectation at the moment that whatever SNRB type provision is currently in the dairy review setting would transfer into the new school and that would be provided for there. Um, the budgets, you know, at the moment, what we're trying to do is to keep as many of our children in the authority as we can. That is causing us pressure on our budgets. We'll see that later when we discuss the outturn position. Um, we'll continue to try and keep our children in county. Um, it does have a consequence um, on TAs and so on. Um, and I think, um, you know, we're working very hard to make sure that we can sustain the flow of funds to our schools and that they use that as effectively as they can to support their learners. Um, it's a two-way street with schools in that area. Um, but I do understand the pressures that they face. Absolutely. OK, we, do, we just mentioned Dairy View School. Uh, as chair, I'm now going to do something quite radical because um, I can see in, in the public gallery uh, we've got the vice chair of governors and former chair of governors at Dairy View School. Um, I know you've been involved in, in this consultation. Is there anything you would like to say to the committee? Maggie, do you want to just come down and, and, and sit by a mic? It says, you, you come on down, the price is definitely right. If you're of a certain age, you'll understand that one. Just press the, the button. There you are. You're live, oh. Mrs. Harris. How alarming. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, um, th and thank you, Will, for all the consultations and the many visits um, we've had from you at Dairy View. We do call upon your time. Um, and I, I apologize for my um, besotted attachment to Dairy View. Um, but it's a very special school. And in all of the county, we do have an area, where we, we are in an area of very high deprivation, the highest free school meals that you've got in the county, very, very specific problems. And uh, I think we're very concerned that we may be in this new process missing a little band of children who aren't quite bad enough to access um, SAPRA's statements, etc who have, there are delays in the diagnosis. Um, we're under pressure as governors to keep within our budgets, do not go into deficit, that is the golden rule. And sometimes the only way you can't go into deficit is actually to release, to reduce your um, teaching support staff. Now for the very special group of children who, don't, who need not necessarily one-to-one, -one, which would probably be covered, but are this little band in between who need either special intervention. So we do have very skilled TAs who take six children, four children to do maths or English or something. Um, we are afraid that with the pressures on budget, we will lose more and more TAs. I already know from 
other meetings that Will and I have attended on the Budget Forum, there are schools in the county who have no TAs at all. We could not survive at Dairy View if we did not have that kind of additional support because of the very specific area that we're in. And so at the point of pleading a special case, but I think it's as well for members to understand there are very specific problems in very specific areas. Um, and whilst I fully support reorganisation, I fully support the closing of our unit, which was not used properly, and we have a going to have an assessment unit on site, we do need to have much more free access, A, for diagnosis, and B, for interaction into the new uh, purple ref pupil referral unit and out again. Quick diagnosis, is, as, as Will has said, is the key. And, and sadly, somewhere along the line, it's all going to need a little bit more funding. Where you find it, I know not. Luckily, that's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only here as an advocate. So, but thank you for your patience. Thank you very much indeed, councillors. I, I think um, Mrs. Harris um, raises some really important points. Um, uh, Derry View is in a, uh, uh, a very challenging um, setting, I think that's very fair to say, um, and we do experience levels of deprivation there which are comparable to anywhere else in South East Wales. Um, the, the challenge for us, in a, in a sense, is that, that uh, the, the size of the, the area doesn't trip into then some of the supported uh, funding arrangements that, uh, that other parts are able to access. Um, I agree entirely with your comments around diagnosis and the speed of diagnosis being hugely important. I think one of the things which we'll see much more of uh, are these notions around uh, revolving doors so that children kind of go receive uh, intensive support and then come back into school. That will become something which is much more common, um, both on the ALN and on the behavioural side. Um, my personal belief is that um, I think notwithstanding your comments around the teaching assistants and so on, I think we need to think more fundamentally and more holistically about the challenges that that particular area of Abergavenny faces um, if we're to be successful in addressing those in the longer term. Um, but I think in the, in the meantime, we'll continue to work as hard as we can with schools to make sure that the support for them is there and as much as we can, um, notwithstanding external pressures, that the budget is there for them as well. Thank you very much. Um, one thing is, is clear, colleagues, and that is that during our watch on this scrutiny committee, there will be very major and significant changes to the education of many of our children. Um, and, and I'd like to, to thank uh, and congratulate Mr. McLean for keeping us in touch as the process has unfolded all the way down the line. Technically, um, what we're being asked for this morning is, is our approval for a delay for one more month. Mr. Fowler has already said that that would have his support and, and nobody has contradicted that. So I'm ta taking that as, as a sense that as a committee, we think you do need that extra month of time because of the number of responses you've had, which I think is a positive sign. Um, so, so um, are, are we happy as a committee that we, we support that? Thank you, thank you, colleagues, uh, and thanks for bringing that, that update to us. Um, moving on to agenda item 10, um, I'm not sure this is going to be such a good news story as some of the others we've heard this morning, but this is the uh, budget monitoring upturn report. So, um, Mrs. Wellington, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chair, very much for uh, um, inviting me today. And to, I'm going to go through the outturn report for the um, year ended 31st of uh, March 2018. Before I start, can I just give apologies for colleagues in children's services that unfortunately no one is available today. 
So while I can give a very brief summary of the um, outturn for children's services, any questions that you have, I, I will take back to them rather than try and answer them myself. I wouldn't want to give uh, any, any information out that wasn't correct. So um, we turn our, our, uh, to agenda item 10 now, which starts on page 129. Uh, if I give a quick brief overview of uh, where we are as a council. So as a council, we were over overall, there was an over, un, overall underspend of 652,000, which is an improvement of nearly 700,000 at the month seven report, which was the previous reporting period. Um, capital spend uh, was 46.8 million against a budget of 47.2 million, but that was after we had already slipped about uh, 11.8 million into uh, 1819, which, as you will know, our major projects within capital are our two secondary schools, and that was uh, the, the main slippage there. All of the details um, in terms of the over and under spends are detailed in the report in 3.2. 1.2 so I'm not going to go through those in any detail but they're there for you. Turning then to page 136 which is children's services and I said this will be very brief. Um, effectively the overspend has increased by just over half a million to 1.6 million. Um, you will note from the commentary there from the chief officer that this is mainly due to uh, complex um, placements that have happened over the year and uh, agency workforce staff within the, uh, within the children's services. But you will also note that there has been a reduction in the agency workforce, and I believe that um, my colleague Tyrone Stokes has, has um, updated you with that uh, in previous periods. Again, the detail of the spend is under 3.3.5. So, as I said, I'm happy to take any questions back that members might have. On more familiar ground, um, <laughs> children and young people, <laughs> On page uh, 137, uh, uh, children and young people were 177,000 overspent. Um, this, we drew on reserves of 93,000, which related to, as you're aware, we've got service level agreements with our schools for both sickness and for maternity cover within schools. Those schemes were overspent, so we built up a reserve. We brought those back, so. Bringing that back in, our overspend was, uh, overspend was actually only 84,000. Um, the details are provided to you in terms of where the individual overspend areas are, but I'll just quickly go through them. So for the individual schools' budgets, which is the, the amount that we give out to schools, that was 169,000, mainly due to some transport costs that we've been supporting and support for, support for schools for um, exceptional one-off costs that we, we have um, supported during the year. Resources was underspent by 85,000. Uh, members, again, because I will be aware that we've been carrying a couple of vacancies um, and we can manage to carry those through the year, so that, that obviously um, added to that underspend. Standards, which is a uh, majority of it is additional learning needs, was 93,000 over. The overspend um, within additional learning needs was at 256,000. However, this was offset by savings within management and, and again within some early years um, funding there. Additional learning needs, just in slightly more detail, the outer county provision um, budget was 36,000 under spent and the in county, and I think um, Will has obviously been talking about that earlier with our desire to keep more pupils within county and therefore providing additional support. Uh, so that was 292,000 over, um, mainly due to resources within classrooms, um, additional support for members of staff. All our savings have been met within uh, the local within CYP. We had a savings target target 395,000. So that's that was all met within year. Just running on now to the schools, uh, 100, page 165 gives all the details of the schools. But if I give a very brief overview. We started the year with, uh, two, with a surplus reserve of 269,000. Members will also be aware that we came to this committee requesting um, <coughs> that the fair funding was uh, set aside for one year in relation to the fact that all of our schools were collectively, not all of our schools, schools are collectively were going into a deficit. Um, we ended the year with a surplus of 175,000, so um, 
we saw an improvement of 730,000 uh, on month seven. Welsh Government provided with us a grant for maintenance at the very end of the year, the end of February, beginning of March, of 345,000, which obviously that contributed to that uh, improvement in school budgets. We had 12 schools in a budget in a deficit at the beginning of the year. We still have 12 schools in a deficit at the end of the year, but they are different schools. I'm pleased to report the ones that came out of deficit as Lanviangle, Kokorni, Chepstow, which members will be very familiar with, now have a surplus of 158,000, and St Mary's. Uh, the ones that have gone into deficit is Our Ladies and St Michael's, Caldercott um, School, and Mega School. Of those 12 schools that are in a deficit, four of them are under 20,000, so the materiality around that deficit is, is not, not uh, huge for us. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, colleagues, there we are. Uh, there are m many, many difficulties hidden behind those figures, of course, for individual schools. Um, it, it gets no easier year on year, does it? Um, any comments on where we are now? In that case, maybe we just note that uh, uh, and uh, pass on. Oh, sorry, Councillor Brown. Sorry, Councillor Jones. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your report, Nikki. Um, it's it's quite a random question, I think. Um, but I just wanted to know something from both of you, actually. School transport for one-off. You noted you said about it for one-off costs. Is that including? Um, transport for inter-school um, sport competitions, for example? Uh, no, no the, um, the transport that I was referring to there is where we support um, our home-to-school transport colleagues where we're running specific routes that our schools have Right, have, sorry, uh, I just wanted to so know what you were yeah, about. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you for that. Thanks for the kind right, uh, My apologies to my vice. What you can't see, members, is that she's kicking me under the table <laughs> here. Um, yes. Mr Fowler. Um, hi, um, I just want to um, talk about Chepstow again because it's a favourite of this committee. Um, I just wonder what lessons can be learned from looking at Chepstow compared to the other three comprehensives who are now in deficit and Chepstow isn't, which is the reversal as it, uh, as it has been for a number of years. And just to see how they managed to get their swing from a deficit of 81 at the start of the year to a surplus now of 158 that's quite a significant swing i just wonder is there any lessons in there for the other comps or i i, I, I just some commentary on that i guess uh thank you mr fowler um in terms of uh, chepstow i think we do need to congratulate them obviously that they you know the scrutiny around the school has been um very intense over the last few years and it, it is a good news story that they have they have come out of a deficit and now are showing a, a large surplus. Um, there is some detail around that, but I, I mean, I'll go into, into sort of in summary, really. There were a number of redundancies within the school. Um, we all know that the, the highest uh, costs for any school are staffing, so there were a number of redundancies. And Chepstow did make um, some redundancies last year, which we obviously will have helped this, this situation. There was also, uh, members will recall, an issue around a photocopying contract, which um, was very expensive to the school. And again, they managed to negotiate their way into a cheaper contract, which brought savings again to that school. Um, like all our secondary schools, um, yes, there are lessons around the, the staffing. I, I'm hopeful that we won't find another Chepstow photocopying contract anywhere yeah. within the local authority. Um, so yes, there are lessons around in, around in, in there, but I think there's also lessons around in the early intervention um, of our schools to ensure that deficits don't grow and that they're taking everything at the you know all savings at the beginning of the year to be able to do that. There's also an emphasis around income, and I think a number of our schools are, are seeing more income coming into the school by working with the EAS and by generating that income. And again, Chepstow has been quite successful in generating our income as as have a number of our secondary schools. Uh, Councillor Brown, I was right this time. Councillor Brown. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, 
But basically, just to um, follow on, if I may, from the um, looking at the Chepstow cluster as a whole, you know, this Chepstow comprehensive, Pembroke, Shaw Newton, St Mary's, the Dell, Thornwell. I mean, as a as a whole, they seem to be <coughs> doing um, quite well in terms of managing um, their budget. And I wonder, is there any sort of um, uh, you know, do, do they work together in terms of helping each other on these sort of things? And I was intrigued to uh, see the savings on utilities, water and, and gas, and whether all the schools should be looking at U-Switch or something of that nature, you know, to, to actually um, uh, make savings, because obviously that's something that, um, you know, householders... Uh, regularly do and looking at the budget and things like photocopying as you say you know looking at the minutiae can actually uh, make a significant difference to budgets and something that in a sense you know the same services is still provided for the um, school so I just wondered if there was any sort of um, you know sort of collaboration there and, and that's why the, um, you know on the whole they're, they're doing well thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, in terms of the Chepstow cluster, yes, they do work together on a number of things. Um, budgets is not one of them, I will say. In oh, well, it's on down here, who's it? Yeah. Um, budget, in terms of budget monitoring, that, that schools are very much do their own budget monitoring. In terms of looking at contracts collectively, all of our schools are doing that because all of our schools now have business managers in place in, in um, not, you know, three different managers covering the four clusters. The business managers work very closely together and they share ideas and, and we are beginning to see, although it's in its early stages, we are beginning to see some savings coming through for all of our schools. But um, all of our schools are um, very clear about their budgets and they do manage their own budgets in terms of um, you know, very independent around that. But I'm not saying that they, they wouldn't share ideas and things like that yeah in terms of the utilities the contract that we've got is certainly a Monmouthshire wide contract I believe it's a South East Wales it might even be a Wales one, but I don't know the detail behind that I know that um, a, no, a, a number of years ago a school did look to go outside of that contract and they couldn't beat the prices and, and you know I think given the, the, the wide area that it covers I think schools would be very um, would find it very difficult to find any any lower prices. Um, in terms of uh, cost comparisons and things like that, yes, all schools have access to a benchmarking tool. I think I've shared that with members, and that might be something that, that members want to see at a future meeting. It's very um, it's a very interesting tool, and and although it doesn't provide the answers for everything, it will give you um, ideas of where you can go and seek those answers. So it will allow schools to look across Wales to similar schools and they can choose on pupil numbers, on teacher numbers, on free school meals, et cetera, et cetera. And they can find similar schools and they can look across Wales and then they can contact that school to say, well, how come you are spending a lot less on electricity or teaching or whatever? So it's, it's a very powerful tool that's been developed across Wales. Uh Briefly, Councillor Brown, yeah. and then yeah, Councillor Just as a very quick follow-up, I mean, obviously it says savings on utilities, and it mentions water and gas, obviously you can't get a, a comparison on water, but um, I just wondered how often the sort of Monmouthshire-wide school um, utilities thing was, was looked at, uh, you know, to make sure that we were getting a competitive price for the schools. Thank you. I'd have to ask our energy colleague, Ian Hockham, to provide details around the contracts and things like that, because I don't have that detail. But I know that all our schools buy into that contract, but I don't know the terms of the contract. But I'm happy to get back to that one. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just looking at the graph, a um, little bit of an explanation, really. There are some schools where there's no, you haven't put anything in the notes. In particular, you mentioned OLSM is now in deficit, but the, there's nothing in the notes. Um, and, and there are several schools where, where there are no notes. Does that sort of, because it's work in progress, or if you could just clarify that for me? Yeah, um, yes, there, there are a number of schools where there are um, no notes, and that's because um, when we write this report, we're given a, um, a variance as to, as to what we have to write notes. You know, so if it's over 10%, we need to write notes. If it's under for whatever, we, we don't need to. But I mean, if there are any specific squir queries around schools, I'm more than happy, because obviously we've got all those notes that we hold centrally. I'm more than happy to share. 
Okay, have we got any other, other comments? Well, if I could thank uh, Mrs. Wellington for bringing that report to us. It's, uh, it, it can't be easy. Uh, and certainly when, when you face head teachers and school bursars as well. Uh, so, so thank you very much for that. Uh, if we could move on to agenda item 11, it's on page 175 uh, uh, of your um, agenda. This is simply the table of actions that uh, have come about as a result of our last meeting. Uh, and I think it's it's pretty self-explanatory, but it's good that, that everything that came up has been actioned, uh, uh, and thanks to officers for that. Um, item 12 is the work programme. Where are we with that, Miss Eilert? Right. Uh, we've called a special meeting chair for the um, 10th of July. Um, I believe it's on the front page of the agenda to note the date and time of that meeting. Um, this is because we have um, quite a lot of extra business. We've got some performance uh, um, reporting to do. We've also for some time wanted to invite um, King Henry and also Derry View to a meeting to discuss the support for refugee children. So um, that invitation has been sent and hopefully, Chair, that we'll be able to do that at that meeting. So that's all that we need to note so far on the work programme today. I wonder if I could raise something I actually uh, said at, at, at Council, uh, last, count, uh, last, last County Council meeting, which was to talk about the performance of looked after children, which has been a concern in this committee before. Uh, and again, while we're talking about King Henry, I mentioned the fact that they had a looked after mentor there who, who worked specifically with that little cohort of youngsters there. Uh, and, and perhaps while we're thinking about uh, good practice that's helping individual children, that, that's something we could, we could bring forward. I did highlight that um, to them in the letter, Chair, so hopefully, you know, that's, that's something that they'll, they'll send the appropriate people. Uh, great. The, the forward planner, again, that's there for our information so that we can really check that everything that should be coming to us for scrutiny is coming to us. Um, and, and we've seen examples where we've picked things up and said, we'd like to look at that, please. So is there anything in that forward planner where, that people have picked up that think we should be looking at it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's there in detail, it's in your agenda, so... Um, okay, so there we are. Nothing that we want to add or specifically highlight there. No, Chair, the, the actions list is as stated. Those have been completed. Um, there is an action that won't appear on that list yet. It's for um, a set of minutes that's still in draft, but we've recently had a joint meeting of adults and CYP Select Committee, um, and I think at that meeting we requested that we brought forward the Supporting People Service Review to this meeting because that had actually just been tabled to the Adult Select and I felt that it was something that you were interested in, the Chair requested it. So that will also come to the meeting in July. I'm sorry, I'm building up extra work for us, colleagues. <laughs> Councillor Brown. Yeah, um, I was interested in finding a, um, a report on an update on the um, progress on the changes in the um, curriculum and um, also uh, it would be useful if we could um, I noticed that on the uh, there's an evaluation report on support provided for s uh, Syrian refugee children and it says King Henry comprehensive to be invited and I think it would be useful if this committee um, had uh, uh, offered an invitation to uh, pioneer schools so that they could talk about the new curriculum the other um, issue that I think would be worthwhile this committee looking at is um, the changing role of ESTIN, um, because I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a recent report about um, an independent review on ESTIN, and um, <clears throat> it would be useful if we could have a look at that, because obviously that's uh, uh, the inspectors of our schools across Wales, and I think it's important that we keep up to date not only with changes um, being proposed in the pioneering schools, because this is going to be something that's going to affect the whole curriculum of Wales and of um, 
Monmouthshire, but also about what's happening in relation to um, uh, the Estin report, because there are significant changes um, being proposed in that Estin report, including, um, for example, um, suspension of um, uh, temporary suspension of of their inspections, apart from the more extreme ends where inspections are needed, so that they can um, be involved in in curriculum development. And there's also an issue to do with the. Um, uh, you know, the independence of Estin. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. McLean, any, any comment you wanted to make there about Donaldson and Estin? Would you be prepared to come and as, as changes develop and keep us abreast? And uh, Absolutely, Chair. I think that there are, Councillor Brown is absolutely right, there are huge changes, and I think it's been alluded to earlier this morning as well, um, just working their way through at the moment in regards to education. Um, there are some things which will be a challenge there will be a challenge for me certainly um, um and for the way in which we work as a, a work with you as a select committee so for instance um where traditionally every year i've come to you and reported um on outcomes at foundation phase key stage two and key stage three and our comparative position um in wales and in our region that will no longer be possible um from this year on um, because those that information will no longer be collated in that way um, the Welsh average will be collated but nothing else um, and there's very very clear expectation that we do not use it as a comparative piece um, it would be my my slight hesitancy at the moment is that it's still a very fluid position um, Welsh government um, I was with colleague directors and the managing director of the EAS yesterday um, it's still working its way through. I don't think they know what it's going to look like. Um, I think the Estin piece is very interesting, and I think Professor Donaldson's report um, uh, gives a good insight into the direction it will probably go. I suspect there are gender items for the autumn, um, rather than and probably later in the autumn. I think it's an absolutely fantastic idea to have um, our um, pioneer schools to talk about the work that they've been doing I think that would be really really positive and perhaps if we could have them alongside the AS who are obviously the lead um, there are a couple other things which are in the pipeline the um, the new teaching and leadership standards are something which I think would be really good for all of this committee to to know about and to understand because that will become the framework whereby we hold schools to account for the standards of their teaching as opposed to the outcomes they get, which is a, a better way of doing things. Um, and then the only other part, um, which is part of normal business, will be um, early in the, uh, the new academic year. <clears throat> it's normally um, right that I come and report to you on our exam day outcomes so that you're aware as to how the schools have done um, over the summer. But uh, more than happy to take those three, absolutely. But they might just take a little bit of time to make sure that we get them into a, a position which means we're not just kind of um, in a very fluid state and there's something more formative for you to reflect on. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I mean, as, as soon as we've got something that, that's concrete that we can look at rather than just guessing where the direction of travel might be, uh, then uh, we'll look to you to come and uh, talk to us again. And, and certainly um, bringing in uh, people from schools to talk about their experience is certainly something I would very much want to see develop. So um, it, it might be nice. I, I, I know that is, is Shy Newton in, in your ward, Councillor Brown, is a pioneer school, isn't it? And it would be lovely to hear people coming in from schools to talk about their experience and give us a chance to question them about that. Um, oh, sorry, Chair. Um, the other one, just to, to say, and hopefully this won't be the case, but I think it would be a, a really positive development for this committee. Um, in terms of outcomes, particularly at Key Stage 4, I think it would be a good thing um, if this committee were to choose to take um, an active role in scrutinising the schools um, in terms of their outcomes. That's not for me to abdicate my role in terms of what happens across the county. But actually, um, one of the things which we've learned is that, you know, for instance, we've I've spent a lot of time with you as a committee and with full council talking around vulnerability and around children who experience multifaceted vulnerability in terms of their outcomes. Actually, for head teachers to convey that to you can be far more impactful than the kind of the second-hand message that sometimes I'm able to portray. So that might be something. Fingers crossed, everyone will have a flyer this summer and we won't have to think about it. Um, but if that wasn't to be the case, I think actually this, um, this committee actually taking that step would be very positive. 
Uh, much as we appreciate the reports from you, Mr. McLean, I, I, I think that's a point well made. Uh, colleagues, the only final thing is to that is to note that um, the scrutiny manager has said we've got an additional meeting now on the 10th of July and to point out that it's at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, just so we're all sure about that, rather than our usual 10 o'clock start. Uh, it's been a fairly long meeting this morning, but lots of interesting stuff. So can I thank you all for your attendance and uh, certainly look forward to talking to our, our, our colleagues who joined us uh, about that uh, about our, our meeting. And you'd like just to say something? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chair. It was really just to uh, make the point and commend the Chair on what I've seen as a most enjoyable and professionally held select meeting today. I was the chair of this august uh, uh, selects more years ago than I care to remember. Um, having just got the reports as the meeting started, I had a chance to really just scan through quickly what you're going to be talking about today, um, but didn't really feel the need to contribute because I was getting a sense that the members here had read the reports and we're really starting to understand and cover the areas that, that, that are important to them. So I've just been uh, a passive spectator today, but, but thoroughly enjoyed the experience. I'm hoping uh, that my colleague David next to me has found it also very useful, and perhaps if he just wants to say a few words to the, the the committee as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's been a thoroughly enjoyable meeting, actually, um, and I didn't say a word during it, which is unusual for me. <laughs> um, but I was impressed by the amount of detail that scrutiny members had to read through. They'd been provided, I thought, with very, very full reports, and they'd been able to home in on the critical points, the ones that really mattered. And I was most impressed, really, with the debate about the, um, the review of additional learning needs and the inclusion service, because I think that that's going to be critical, certainly in POWIS as well, over the next year or two, as we move from the position we are now to where we ought to be because we find that we are spending a disproportionate amount of money on inclusion and not really getting the results that we should get with it. And I think that you know, we constantly say in Paris that it's 120 miles from north to south and it, um, and it reaches from the, uh, uh, from the Dovey estuary to the Shropshire border, that it is a, a big lump of land. And we've got two special schools, and the amount of time that we spend transporting children in an area like that, away from their natural community, concerns me, and I don't think we're getting the result. And I think it's, it's sort of cleared my mind a bit listening to your debate today, and I thank you very much for that, sir. Well, th thank you both for, for those very positive comments. I have to say it is a tremendous honour to chair this committee. Uh, and, and colleagues, thank you all very much for your time and patience this morning. Uh, and I'll see you again at that additional meeting next month. Thank you very much. <laughs>